Hi everybody, I'm Sammy Strutt, Head of Member Development for Bigger, and I'd like to welcome you to this Continue to Learn Extra webinar. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Colin Mumford, Technical Support Manager for Bayer. Today, Colin will be talking about how you can use entomopathogenic nematodes to control turf pests the natural way. He will be discussing how to store and handle them, how to identify the optimum time to apply them, and how to optimize their application. Colin has a background in golf course management, as well as a wide ranging experience and qualifications in the amenity and sports turf sector. His role as technical support manager at Bayer is largely focused on advising industry professionals with general management, best practice and technical advice. Colin also oversees new product trials for the UK and Ireland. Please feel free to ask any questions via the chat function that can be found at either the top or the bottom of your screen and we will pose the questions on your behalf. With that, I will hand over to you, Colin. Right, uh, thank you, Sammy, and thank you everyone for attending today. Um, as Sammy said, I'm going to be talking about entomopathogenic nematodes. Um, if you see my head moving, it's because my, my screen is in this direction and the camera is in this direction. So I'm not being distracted by anyone in the background, it's just uh, looking at my screen. Um, so the things that, uh, as Sammy said, uh, um, I'll be talking about today, um, what are entomopathogenic nematodes? Um, I'll give you an example of other industries where they're used as well and what pests they control. Uh, and then I want to talk about how they, how they work, the, the, the life cycle of the nematodes. And understanding that is sort of key to uh, the success of uh, using them against turf pests. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about the sort of the nuts and bolts of it, you know, how to store them, um, how to get the, the correct timing of the application and some uh, tips on how to apply them. So uh, entomopathogenic, entomopathogenic nematodes, I, I shan't be saying that word uh, too often today. Um, what are they? Well, firstly, I, I think we should distinguish um, the different types of nematodes that we uh, encounter in sports turf management. Um, there are good ones and there are bad ones. Entomopathogenic nematodes, uh, they're the good ones. They control uh, pests of turf. Um, the bad ones are the plant parasitic nematodes. Uh, these are the ones that will um, feed on the root system of your turf and cause the root system to, to de deform, uh, stress out the grass plant uh, and ultimately uh, make your, your turf look quite ill. So entomopathogenic nematodes, I'm just going to refer to them as nematodes from now on. Um, what are they? Well, um, if you had a, a microscope or a, a, a powerful magnifying glass and you, you had a look at them underneath there, um, this is what you would see. Um, essentially, uh, they're a worm. Um, they're a half a millimeter to 0.9 millimeters long or 500 to 900 micrometers, uh, in, if you prefer. Um, the important thing to understand about the nematodes is that they all have um, uh, four larval stages and uh, they go through these four stages and at the end of each larval stage uh, a new cuticle uh, is produced and the old one is molted off. Now um, it's the third larval stage that we're really interested in because um, they will produce uh, an alternative third larval stage. Uh, this has evolved and it's a, a specialized sort of survival and, and dispersal stage. And this is referred to as a dower larva, a dower, a dower juvenile. Um, let's put it up on the screen, that's easier. Um, its uh, occurrence is dependent on certain environmental conditions and producers of nematodes are able to mimic these uh, conditions so that they produce this um, third larval stage, this, this dower juvenile. Now, um, the, the third, the, the dower juvenile, um, it can withstand adverse and it's, uh, it's, it doesn't feed, it has um, good fat reserves, so it's better able to uh, survive in, in extreme conditions. Uh, and this is why when you buy a, a nematode product, it, is, it will be a dower juvenile that you're applying. Uh, you can also see uh, on the screen there that um, they uh, react to, to CO2 um, and basically this is one of the methods that they use to, um, uh, to, to find uh, a host uh, target, you know, a, a, a pest to, to reside in. Um, 
and because they're they're better able to withstand the you know harsher environments uh, they can survive in all soil environments and uh, one thing that i would like to add is that um these nematodes um, they're not harmful to humans uh, or plants or other vertebrates now just as a quick where they're used um, you can see that uh, they're used here in nurseries so um, ornamental horticulture um, for various pests such as the vine weevil um, excuse me while i let my dog out sorry about that she's keep scratching at the door um, so the uh, other industries are turf as we know uh, and then greenhouses for uh, food production and here are some examples of uh, crops uh, that they're applied to to control pests of those crops. Um, so mushrooms, soft fruits, top fruits, citrus, corn, and palm trees. And there's a whole array of uh, different uh, insect pests there uh, on the screen as well. Now, in terms of uh, typical UK pests, um, you can see here we have quite a, uh, an extensive list. It, this isn't like a, um, a comprehensive list, but it gives you a good example of the various pests that are controlled uh, in the UK. Uh, but you'll see that leather jackets uh, are on that list, as well as uh, chafer grubs. And these are both uh, real problems of uh, turf, uh, that where they, they feed on the root system, sever the root system, and the plant, the grass plant can't take up water or nutrients. Um, but you'll also see that uh, in warmer climates, uh, the, the, the nematodes are, are deployed, um, particularly on golf courses. So uh, mole crickets in uh, warmer climates are a real issue and uh, nematodes are one way to control them but um, in general though uh, all insect larvae uh, in the soil will be controlled by nematodes um, so then they're, they're not uh, specific to one uh, particular pest uh, they are really a, a broad spectrum uh, pest control uh, option now for today's talk um, I'm just going to refer to the chafer grub. That's my uh, uh, pest of choice uh, today. Uh, and I, I've used this because we're, we're coming into uh, chafer grub season now. You know, uh, the beetle is known as the May bug. We're in May uh, and, and typically they, they will start to, to come out of the ground and, and become a problem. Uh, the adults here uh, lay in the rigs. Um, the, the top two images in this uh, slide, you can see uh, are showing the damage that the chafer grubs themselves cause as i mentioned they they sever the root system the grass plant can't take up water and nutrients uh, and as a result when we have dry conditions the uh, the, the grass will will have uh, drought symptoms and you know can potentially die back but um also because the uh, to the soil because it does have, doesn't have a root system anchoring it to the soil uh, the turf can easily be peeled back and um, if you can peel back the turf easily then so can um, the the, the uh, birds and mammals that feed uh, on grubs so in, in the bottom images you can see damage caused by birds on the right and damage caused by uh, mammals um, most likely badgers uh, on the left hand side so how do uh, nematodes work? How can we, we prevent this uh, from happening with nematodes? Well, um, to understand how they work, we really need to, to look at their life cycle. And um, we'll start from the point of we've introduced nematodes. Um, the nematodes uh, firstly need to locate a host. Uh, they need that host to, to complete their, their life cycle. Sorry about that. The dog wanted to come in again. Um, the um, so they, they they search for a or they, they seek out they they locate a host. Um, once they've located a host, and I mentioned uh, they'll use CO two um, uh, emissions from uh, they hone in on them following the the, the CO two trail that, that the pests give off. Um, but once they've um, located a uh, a grub in this case um, they need to um, they need to uh, attach to it and actually penetrate uh, into it so uh, they will typically use the natural openings uh, that are available in the grub so that the mouth of the anus but um, for some other in insects uh, the larvae and grubs um, 
they, they have what's called spiracles and spiracles are a, a, essentially a breathing hole that's down the side um, of, of the insect or, or the larvae or the grub. Now once the uh, nematodes have got into the, um, the host pest, um, the nematodes actually have a, a bacteria in them. It's a symbiotic bacteria, so um, it's a, a sort of mutually beneficial relationship between the bacteria and the nematode. The nematode acts as the, uh, the transport mechanism for the bacteria, so it gets it from A to B, uh, and the, the bacteria will actually sort of, when it's released, will create the conditions that the nematode needs to complete its life cycle. So the Nematodes will release that, that bacteria. Um, it's the bacteria actually that will um, paralyze the, uh, the, the, the grub uh, and cause it to die. It's, it's not the nematodes that actually kill the grub, it's the bacteria that they release that, that kills the grub. But in releasing that grub, as I say, it creates the conditions for the nematode to complete its life cycle um, and it provides a, a food source for, for the, uh, the nematode as well. So the nematode, it will um, go from that third larval stage to the fourth uh, larval stage, become a, a, an adult, uh, and then it, it will um, it will it will uh, multiply uh, and produce offspring. Now, the um, when the the, the nematodes uh, inside that grub have exhausted all the resources, they, you know, they've eaten everything that's possible to eat. Uh, they will vacate the uh, the, the, the dead body, the, the cadaver, um, they'll, they'll exit and they'll go and search for uh, a new host uh, to, to complete uh, their life cycle. You know, the offspring will go and find a, a new host to complete their life cycle. And so it, it carries on uh, in a loop. They'll, they'll locate the uh, host, uh, get inside it, release bacteria, multiply, uh, and then uh, exit the host. Now, in terms of that's the, the life cycle uh, for sort of all nematodes, uh, the way in which they actually locate the, uh, the host uh, varies from species to species. And so I have a few examples here of how they actually uh, locate the, the host. Um, we call this first one um, a, a hunter, and um, I'm gonna attempt to pronounce its name. It's um, Heterohabditis bacteriophora, or something like that. But it's, it's, you can see it's on the screen there. Um, these will act, are a sort of a, a seek and destroy uh, nematode, if you like. They will actively uh, seek out, hunt down the, uh, the prey, uh, attach themselves to it, penetrate and, and complete their life cycle. Uh, then we have uh, a, a different um, activity. Um, this is uh, one we refer to as a, a resident, uh, the resident. Uh, this is uh, Steinonema carpocapsae, a bit easier to pronounce. Uh, and what this does, um, it doesn't go looking for the, um, uh, the uh, host species. Uh, it will sit and wait for something to come along. Uh, and when it does come along, it will jump on it, ambush it, uh, attach itself to it, penetrate uh, and complete its life cycle. Example I've got here, which we've termed uh, uh, the explorer. Um, this is uh, Steinonema feltiae. Um, these are more tolerant of uh, uh, colder conditions, so as low as 10 degrees centigrade. Um, and their strategy for uh, getting hold of a, a pest is sort of a halfway between uh, that of the hunter and the resident. So it, it will go out seeking the, uh, the pest, but then it will, it, will, it, will hand, it will stand back, wait for one to come along uh, and then jump on it, ambush it and uh, attach itself and then um, complete its life cycle. Now in terms of uh, getting the most out of nematodes, uh, ideally the, the more uh, types of activity you have, uh, the better. So um, rather than just have one species, you know, ideally you'd, you'd have more. So uh, you know, three, if you had all three of these species, uh, that, that would be ideal. Uh, you get greater effectiveness from them is that each species wants to become the, the dominant species. And to become the dominant species, it needs to multiply. Uh, and to multiply, it needs to, to find a, a target host to complete its life cycle, to produce uh, offspring. And because each species wants to become the dominant species, they try to outcompete each other. So effectively, um, they become that bit more aggressive uh, and more voracious uh, in, in their attempts to uh, 
to get hold of a host species to multiply, complete their life cycle, um, and become that dominant species. So, th so th three different activities, uh, three different species is preferable. That's a bit about the nematodes and their life cycle. Now I really want to talk about the, you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts, so how to best to, to store them and, and apply them and so on. So um, storage, what are the right conditions for storing nematodes? Um, really, uh, fresh is best, I think, is the motto we should use here. Um, really, you should be using your nematodes as soon as you take delivery of them, um, if the, you know, the ground weather conditions uh, allow. Um, so. If the ground weather conditions don't allow, you know, it could be um, too windy to spray, the ground could be too dry, um, it, the whole host, it could be too sunny. As I say, you don't want to uh, expose them to, to bright sunlight because UV light will, um, will, will kill them. Um, if uh, the ground conditions aren't correct uh, and you need to store them, there's a couple of things that you need to bear in mind. Um, uh, they'll come in a container, a box of some sort, uh, you know, various Nematode products come in different containers, but essentially they'll, they'll come in a box. Um, what you don't want to be, do when you take delivery of it is open that box outside your sheds in bright sunlight because the, uh, the sunlight will uh, actually, the UV light will, will kill the, the uh, nematodes or certainly will uh, drastically reduce their, their lifespan. So, so don't expose them to direct sunlight. Um, if you do need to store them, uh, don't expose them to extremes of temperature, don't, don't freeze them, uh, don't expose them to, to, to temperatures above 30 degrees centigrade, because again, this will significantly reduce uh, their lifespan. Um, so ideally, you want to put them in a fridge if you, if you need to, to store them for any time. Um, so take them out of the container that they came in, the box they came, came in, put them in the fridge, uh, don't just stack them in a corner. You ideally you want to sort of loosely store them. Um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you stack them, potentially you could end up getting uh, crushing injuries. Um, you know, they'll start to consolidate and uh, it's not conducive to, to, to the health of the, the nematodes. So ideally just loosely store them in a fridge. Uh, and the fridge needs to be at a temperature between four and eight degrees. It can be as high as 10 degrees, but I tend to err on the side of caution and say that four to eight degrees would be the optimum range to store the uh, nematodes uh, in the fridge. Um, now nematodes will typically have a six week shelf life from the date of production at the, uh, at the, the producers. Um, by the time that you receive them, uh, it, you know, it could be several days after they were produced. Uh, so you should have uh, a minimum of uh, a five week shelf life uh, with with your nematodes, uh, and you know that should be plenty of time with which to uh, to, to actually deploy them out on, on the golf course. And the um, we, we have seen that the nematodes uh, will last longer than their sort of um, uh, given shelf life. But really, to ensure that you're getting the maximum out of them, you, you should use them before the expiry date. And there will be an expiry date uh, on the pack. So uh, make sure you store them correctly and make sure you use them before the, the end of that expiry date. Um, now this, this next uh, slide really is, is inspired by Monty Python and, and the dead parrot sketch. You know, it's, it's not dead, it's resting. Uh, and that's really what can happen with nematodes. So if you're um, of a mind to take a sample of the nematodes out of a pack and put them in a solution, stick them under a microscope to, to see what the health of the nematodes are, uh, you should see this. They should be um, all curvy, uh, moving, wiggling. That's uh, a live nematode. Uh, dead nematodes are really easy to spot because they're dead straight, you know, uh, pardon the pun, but they're, they're, like, they're like matchsticks, they're, they're dead, dead, dead straight. And they'll have some uh, gas bubbles forming inside them, which is that, that, that bacteria starting to, to, to ferment away. We come on to the next one, which is uh, resting nematodes, and they can be quite difficult to uh, to identify, or can be easy to mistake for for dead nematodes. Uh, but there is one way to to identify them. So if you look here where the arrow is pointing, you'll see that it's a, a straight nematode, which you'd think is a dead one. 
but it, it's bent at one end, either at the, hand, at the head or the tail. Um, and that is um, an indication that it's resting. So it's not dead, it's resting. Um, so that's just one distinction. I think it's important to, to know uh, if you are to take a sample, look at it under a microscope or a magnifying glass, don't jump to the conclusion, ah, oh, this is dead. Uh, if it's got that bent end uh, on the, the tail or the head, yeah, it means it's resting, it's not actually dead. So we come on to the, the timing of uh, the application and um, really it's important that the application coincides with egg hatch. Uh, nematodes, they, they won't uh, control eggs, it's the, uh, the, the, the offspring from those eggs, the, uh, the, the newly hatched, the juvenile grubs or juvenile larvae uh, that you want to control. So for, um, for Schaefer grubs, and it's the, the first or second instar stage of growth uh, that's most uh, susceptible to the, the nematodes. And uh, this was the case for uh, insecticides. So uh, a few years ago, we had merit turf. Uh, that would only control uh, the first and the second instar stage of growth. Uh, and conversely, uh, insecticides that have been available the last couple of years with a, an emergency approval, they, they only control first and second instar stage of growth. So we want to uh, our application to coincide with the egg hatch. How do we, we, we know that when eggs are being hatched? Uh, and that really comes down to monitoring the activity of the, the adult uh, beetle, the Schaefer beetle, or in the case of leather jackets, monitoring the activity of the, the crane fly, the adult crane fly. Now, as a, a, a general guide, the uh, Schaefer beetle species are active from mid-May to late June um, in a typical year. Um, this might not be the case every year. So last year, um, they were a good six weeks, or the last couple of years, they were a good six weeks late coming out of the ground. And so they were more into the, the July period. Um, conversely, with uh, crane flies, the, the one that we, we typically get on turf is the European crane fly. Uh, and in, in a typical year, uh, the crane flies are active between late August and early October. But last year, uh, they really didn't start turning up until October. So again, they were quite late. So environmental conditions do have an influence on uh, the timing of them emerging as adults. And when they're emerged as adults, uh, they, will, they will be actively laying eggs in your turf, uh, in the soil under your turf. Um, one other crane fly that we um, can get on uh, our turf is, although it's called the common crane fly, it, it's not the common one that we get, get on turf. The European crane fly is the, uh, the, 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 the crane fly that we get uh, in abundance on turf, but um, the common crane fly is quite different. Um, that will have, uh, can produce several generations uh, throughout the year. So if you see a crane fly in springtime or in the summer, that is most likely going to be a common crane fly. Now, I've said you want to monitor the adult activity. Uh, the best way to, to monitor it is to use something like a pheromone trap. Uh, you would need to, to you know, check the pheromone traps on a regular basis, but uh, if you put the pheromone traps, you know, dot them around uh, your facilities, um, you know, Schaefer beetles, uh, there's you know, specific pheromones for you know, beetles and for, for crane fly, um, so get the appropriate one. Um, the Schaefer beetles, uh, they'll go into the trap, you'll come along, you'll see a couple of uh, Schaefer beetles in there. You can empty the trap, uh, dispatch the, uh, the, the beetles, uh, and then put the, the trap back, um, and then keep checking it. And what you'll see over time is you'll get more and more beetles going into that trap. And then eventually you'll see a decline in the number of beetles uh, that will be, or, or crane fly, that will be coming into to that trap. And that's the key to knowing when to uh, apply nematodes. Um, you want to be applying the nematodes three to four weeks uh, after the peak of activity. So um, similar to the current situation with COVID-19 and the government talk about uh, the, you know, the, the peak of the curve and we're over the, the peak of the curve, um, you're looking for that, that decline in activity of the adults in the uh, pheromone traps. Um, and then when you see that decline, three to four weeks is when you should be, uh, later is when you should be applying them. 
Now, the reason why it's three to four weeks is that uh, all the time that the adults have been active, they've been laying eggs. Uh, the eggs take uh, two weeks to, to hatch, um, but because all eggs aren't laid at the same time and therefore they don't all hatch out at the same time, if you allow three to four weeks before you apply the nematodes, um, you know, the vast majority of all those eggs would have hatched out and you will then uh, be able to uh, have um, grubs there or larvae there that the nematodes can immediately um, target and complete their life cycles in. And then for the remainder, uh, the, the offspring from, from those uh, nematodes uh, should uh, go to um, other uh, new, newly hatched uh, larvae or grubs. Now, um, in terms of uh, how to apply the, uh, the grubs, um, the First, before you do any applications, you want to make sure that you've got the ground conditions uh, as, as best as possible to, to accommodate the nematodes. So if you've got lots of thatch in your, in your turf, uh, you want to try and do everything you can to minimize uh, the thatch because you want the nematodes where the roots are. Uh, and if you've got any, any sort of substantial thatch, the nematodes can get held up in that thatch layer uh, and not get down to the roots where, where the actual pests are. So anything you can do to reduce thatch will, will help. Um, similarly, uh, if you can avoid using granular fertilizers uh, prior to and after you've applied the nematodes, just initially, because uh, they can um, uh, effectively, you, you can get some scorching uh, from the fertilizer, which is uh, damaging. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily the case for all granular fertilizers, but as a general rule, if you can avoid using a, general, uh, a, a granular fertilizer, a couple of weeks before and a couple of weeks after the application, um, that will have less impact on the, uh, the actual nematodes. Um, ideally, you want to puncture the surface as well. So uh, this will just aids the, uh, the nematodes to, to get, get into the, to the surface. So using something like a sorrel roller or micro or needle tines prior to uh, an application just helps get them into the surface. And um, Whatever you do, don't apply nematodes to uh, a dry soil. Um, nematodes are very sensitive. Uh, they need moisture to, to ma maintain them uh, themselves. Uh, if it's too dry, uh, the nematodes will just desiccate and they become unviable, they, they'll die. So if you irrigate the day before you, you intend to apply, um, that will ensure there's adequate moisture uh, in the ground for the nematodes. Um, and then a couple more points, um, root zone temperature. Um, you want to apply the nematodes when you've had uh, temp soil temperatures of 12 degrees um, or more for at least several hours a day. They need that, that temperature just to keep them uh, more, more active. And as I've said already, uh, avoid uh, applying nematodes in direct sunlight. So the best time to apply them is first thing in the morning with low light intensity uh, or in the evening when there's low light intensity, or if it's uh, an overcast day, uh, so you, you know, it's not a bright sunny day. Uh, in terms of uh, your, your sprayer, um, the, the nematodes can withstand a pressure of up to 20 bar, but ideally you want to keep your pressure below five bar. Um, it, it just makes it more comfortable for the nematodes when they're being forced through a, a nozzle. Uh, and also from your sprayer's point of view, you, you don't want the pump, uh, you know, doing overtime to try and crank up uh, a high amount of uh, pressure. So if you can keep it below five bar, um, that would be uh, ideal. Uh, remove all the filters though, um, because nematodes will get caught up in filters. Um, if they don't get clogged in the filters, you're ultimately you'll just be uh, applying straight water uh, because they're, they're held back by the, um, the, the filters. Generally, they will get clogged uh, and, and cause a, a disruption in the flow. So remove all the filters. Uh, if you're using a knapsack sprayer, remove the, the, the filter in the hand lance as well, uh, and that will avoid uh, any issues. Um, I've got here also about avoid um, having uh, the heating of the tank. So uh, if you are thinking of applying of an evening, uh, but you think, right, just to speed up the process, I'll fill the tank with water now and I'll, you know, it's left parked outside during the day. Um, if it's, if it's, it's going to warm up the, uh, the, the tank, warm up the water, uh, and that wouldn't be ideal. You want to use uh, cool water uh, to get the most out of those uh, nematodes when, when applying them, or to be the least harmful to, to the nematodes. 
Um, a couple of other general rules when applying uh, the nematodes. Um, if you have a tank with a small tank capacity, or if it is an Aptex sprayer, you want to pre-mix the, uh, the nematodes in a bucket into like an emulsion uh, and then pour it into the tank. Uh, but always, if possible, uh, if you've got agitation, keep the ag agitation going so that they're uh, kept a nice uh, uniform distribution within the solution. Uh, now, I mentioned the, the size of the, the, the Dower juveniles earlier, uh, and I've got it on here again. Uh, and this is just to reiterate, reiterate that uh, you want large uh, droplets. So use uh, nozzles that will produce a, a coarse uh, droplet uh, spray uh, droplet uh, spray pattern, uh, because you need big, big drops to, to carry the nematodes. And um, because you want the nematodes in the soil, you don't want them on the turf, uh, big drops have the added benefit that they're going to bounce and roll off the, the, the leaves and the turf canopy and ultimately end up uh, on, on the, the, the surface of the soil uh, where they can then uh, wash into the, uh, the root zone. Um, one other consideration, uh, and this is, relates to irrigation after applications, uh, as well. Um, don't apply them if heavy rainfall is uh, forecast because uh, if you're on a constructive profile, so a sand dominant root zone that's free draining, or if you're on a push up green, an old you know, natural soil green that's got a good soil, good soil structure and it is still free, um, free draining. Um, if the nematode, if you apply the nematodes and it starts to rain heavily, um, they can actually be washed through the the, the root zone and, and go down the drain. You know, the, the, the nematodes need to get to their host and get in their host uh, before any large soil. Otherwise, they can get washed through the system. Uh, and so the, the same applies to uh, irrigation. Once you've applied them, uh, the nematodes, if you give a very light irrigation, uh, just to, if there are any left on, the, on the, the leaf surface, which they shouldn't be if you, if you had these large droplets going down, but if there are, light irrigation will just wash them in, into, into the, the, the root zone of the soil. Um, but don't over irrigate because uh, if you over irrigate, you can flush them through the root zone, or if you don't flush them through the root zone, you can actually drown them. Uh, they, they, you know, nematodes need air as much as they need water. So, you know, be mindful that you want to keep this, the soil moist, but, but don't irrigate to the point where you're, you're uh, getting drainage to occur or where you're saturating uh, the, the turf. Now, I've just got the last two um, slides. I, I realise we're getting a bit tight for time now. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, the dead bodies, the, the cadavers. Um, some people, when they've applied nematodes, they like to dig up a bit of the turf to see how effective the, uh, the, the nematodes have been, and then they can't find any uh, dead bodies that you know um, and so they think oh it hasn't worked well this is hopefully will explain uh, why that is um, so first and foremost uh, the cadavers will be different colors you get red ones and gray ones dependent on which species of nematode actually um, got into them uh, and the bacteria that they released um, so you can you'll clearly see red ones and, and gray ones uh, but as I say you need to do that quite quickly because the, the, the cadavers, the dead bodies, uh, they decay really quickly because ultimately they're just a, an empty shell because all the innards have been uh, eaten out by the nematodes. Um, and if you do find them, they might not have any deployed uh, to move on to uh, the, the next uh, uh, target host. And perhaps this image will uh, explain it in greater detail. Um, so this is my, my last slide. Uh, you can see here, if I wave my mouse around, um, there's numbers one to 10, um, and these are, are indicating the cadavers. So you can see number four, you can barely see it. Um, number five, you can barely see that one. Uh, same for three and two. You can see six a bit easier, but seven, eight, and nine, and 10, you can see quite clearly, um, because these were probably uh, infected with the nematodes at a later date so it's taken that bit longer or it could be due to the, the uh, species of chafer grub you don't typically just get one type of chafer grub in your soil so if you had a small welsh chafer or a, a big fat juicy cock chafer you know there's a big difference in size uh, and that could uh, also explain why you can see one and not the other but you can see here uh, this white dot is a grub that survived, and this white dot here is a grub that survived, um, you know, ones that haven't been infected. Um, so if you pulled back the, the turf and you saw some living grubs, 
uh, and you couldn't see any dead ones, you'd be thinking, well, that didn't work. But um, the case is uh, they, they have worked. Um, it's just that, that, that those cadavers, they, they will break down, rot down very quickly. Um, this image on the top right hand here, uh, you can see as an example of a, a, a grub that's um, turned red from um, the, uh, the, the nematode species that um, is difficult to pronounce there. Uh, so, so I shan't attempt it. Um, but you can see on this lower image, uh, hopefully you can see that on your screens, uh, this is a cadaver that actually has nematodes in it um, and it has uh, turned red as well. So um, that was a, a quick whistle stop tour of some, some basic tips on uh, nematodes. Uh, and so I, I've, I've quickly explained uh, what the nematodes are, whether we've got good ones, entomopathogenic nematodes, we've got bad nematodes, the plant parasitic nematodes, and, and everything I've talked about today is applying the, uh, the good ones, the entomopathogenic nematodes. Um, I briefly mentioned it, other industries where they use it, horticulture and food production, uh, and gave some examples of, of pests that they control, but in general, uh, any insect larvae in the soil, uh, they will control. Uh, I've also explained uh, briefly about how they work, so that the life cycle of the nematodes, uh, that they release this symbiotic bacteria, which is the bacteria that kills the, the, uh, the grub, not the nematode itself. It just uh, creates the, the conditions for the nematode to uh, complete its life cycle. Uh, and then finally, uh, I've talked about how to store them. So in a fridge, four to eight degrees, don't expose them to direct sunlight. Um, ideally use them as soon as the, they uh, as you, you can. Um, and with your time of applications, uh, use pheromone traps to monitor the activity of, uh, of, of the adults and apply three to four weeks after you've seen that peak of activity. Um, and then finally, um, how to apply them. As I say, um, take all the filters out of your sprayer. Uh, if you've got a small capacity sp sprayer, uh, pre-mix them. Uh, um, also, ensure that, that your ground conditions are right. You haven't got dry soil before you apply them. You've minimized the, the amount of thatch that's present, puncturing the surface as well to, to help them get into the surface. So uh, thank you very much for, for listening. That, as I say, that was a, a, a brief uh, overview of uh, entomopathogenic nematodes and how to store and apply them. Um, if you have any questions, uh, or if you think of some, we'll, we'll have a question and answer session now, but if you think of any questions at a later date, uh, my contact details are there on the screen, colin.mumford at bayer.com. So please feel free to email them to me. Um, also, we, we, yeah, we have more information uh, on, on our website. So that uh, is there. Um, I have one final screen for you. Uh, this is the, the code for your uh, CPD points. Um, so I shall put that up now and then hand back to Sammy. Many thanks, Colin. Um, I've learned some things that I never thought I would need to learn today, I have to say. <laughs> um, we've got some questions coming in. Um, so from our uh, viewers. Um, so I shall start ticking through them. Um, obviously, if I repeat myself not having much technical knowledge, then, uh, then you can uh, correct me. Um, so, first question, how far will the EPNs move from the application area, i.e. migrate to areas other than sprayed? Yeah, certainly. So, they, they don't move a, a fantastic amount. Having said that, um, I've seen trials with the, uh, the three species, and because they're more competitive, uh, yeah, more aggressive, they, uh, they, they seek out more, uh, and they will move up to six inches in the soil, both horizontally and vertically. Now, six inches doesn't sound very far, but you know, when you're half a millimeter or you know, 0 0.9 of a millimeter, uh, six inches is a phenomenal distance to essentially go potholing, because that's what a, a nematode needs to do to get through the soil. It, it, it's it's potholing, basically. Um, so yeah, the, up to six inches, it would be the, yeah, the maximum. Okay. Um, will the pH water levels impact the nematodes when spraying? Uh, it it can do. Um, so you know, but it, only if you've got extremes of, of of pH. So if you've got really acidic or really alkaline. So um, you know, ideally, you want your pH. You know, the ideal would be neutral, but somewhere you know around you know, just above seven, just below seven, um, would be fine. Okay. Um, 
is there a pre-application and post-application VMC range to aim for on surfaces? Uh, yes, so you, you don't want to, to saturate the, the, the surface. So um, VMC, volumetric moisture content, um, so we're, we're talking it in percentages really, um, and uh, around 25% volumetric moisture content would, would be uh, ideal. So, so of, of the soil, you've got your, um, your pores, your drainage pores and capillary pores for retaining moisture, uh, and of those pores, you know, 25% uh, volumetric moisture content would, would be um, would be suitable. Okay, um, I'm glad you explained what VMC is because I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, can an application of nematodes be done in conjunction when applying compost teas, or would it be feasible to culture these nematodes in a compost brew? Uh, so nematodes are compatible with many many things. Um, we're in the process of, of producing a, a document that shows uh, you know, all the things that they're compatible with fungicides, uh, can, well, not all, but you know, certain species are more compatible than, than others with certain things. So that they can be compatible with fungicides, herbicides, um, uh, compost teas, uh, certainly. So uh, we're actually compiling a, a list of those and that will be on our, our website, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. But um, Yes, uh, is, is the answer. Um, I suppose really um, you should seek advice from the, any uh, supplier um, who is uh, selling you something uh, that you're intending to mix uh, with the nematodes. Um, but uh, ultimately they're, they're very robust because I say that the, the nematodes that you're applying are this third larval stage, this um, uh, the, the, the dower juvenile, and, and they're, they're very uh, abled, uh, able to, to withstand quite inhospitable uh, environments uh, which you know other things in a, in a mix could could create so so yes uh, yes is the answer <laughs> okay great um will one application of all three species survive a full season with the correct soil environment if we had a period of heavy rain would you need another application for the pest later in the season uh really the need for a second application depends on how serious the problem is uh, on your facility. Um, when you apply uh, the nematodes, um, they'll go through that cycle, produce offspring, and those offspring will go uh, to uh, other um, uh, host pests uh, within in the soil profile. Um, but it, it's not uh, a process that is ongoing. It doesn't. You don't just apply once and then it's going to carry on. Uh, until everything is completely eradicated from from your soil, because those um, it depends on the, the conditions in your soil. Uh, I, you know, we, we look to produce the conditions that are uh, beneficial to to the nematodes, so you know, maintain good health in the nematodes. And so by doing that, when they produce their offspring, uh, that larval stage isn't going to go to a, become a, a dower juvenile. Um, it's it's going to be a, a regular. Um, third uh, larval stage and so um, that's why you don't really get that that ongoing sort of uh, chain of events uh, to occur it it will happen for you know one or two generations but it, it would tail off so um, a, a long-winded answer where regards um, high infestations are, are required whether a second application is required and there are two strategies um, one strategy is to apply a sort of a half rate of uh, nematodes um, and then wait for two weeks and then apply the other half uh, of the nematodes so that you, you're um, sp spreading uh, your, your bet as it were you're, you're, you know, you're getting those hatched eggs now uh, and uh, applying those at a later date to get uh, secondary um, uh, eggs that have hatched uh, but what's really important is um, how many nematodes you're applying uh, really. So um, there are various nematode products uh, available. They all typically have the same application rate. Uh, and that um, is, uh, well, I can only speak from my own experience of you know, uh, Bayer's nematode product because um, I've sort of uh, been involved with that. But um, so for that, it um, comes in at a 500 million nematode pack size and that, that 500 million nematodes uh, will treat an area a thousand meters squared. That equates to 500,000 nematodes per square meter. So you are putting an you know, extremely high number 
with nematodes down. And uh, a worst case scenario for Schaefer grub infestation uh, would be about a thousand grubs per meter squared. You know, that would be a horrendous uh, infestation. Um, so if, if assuming all the nematodes you've applied, those 500,000, if they all found a, a target host uh, and you had a uniform distribution, uh, that would equate to um, 500 nematodes per grub. Uh, and given the size of a, uh, a nematode and the size of a grub, um, to, to, to give you an image, uh, that would be the equivalent of a human being being attacked by 500 rabid budgies. You know, so, um, so the, uh, the amount you're applying is it's a colossal amount and uh, it, it should really uh, resolve the issue. Um, you're not going to control every single uh, grub in, in the soil, as I mentioned, but um, you would get it down to a um, acceptable level. And uh, but if if it's a, a serious infestation, then a second application uh, would be prudent. I'm just glad that I don't have to count the five hundred thousand into each pack. That must take yes. that must take quite a while. But it's five <laughs> five hundred million in a pack. Oh, five hundred million! Oh God, that'll yeah. take even longer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so uh, we've been asked here, what are your thoughts on applying nematodes with a wetting agent? Uh, so first and foremost, uh, you need to make sure that the wetting agent is compatible with nematodes. So some wetting agents have uh, are very hazardous uh, to nematodes, can, you know, can kill them. Uh, other uh, wetting agents uh, are safe to use with uh, nematodes. So you need to you know, speak to your supplier, make sure that tests have been done, that they are they're confident that they've proven that the, the, um, the, the wetting agent is compatible with uh, the nematodes. So that, that's the, the first and foremost. Um, now I mentioned you want big droplets because you want, you know, you want to get your nematodes to, to the soil. Um, so you want to use a, if you are to use a wetting agent, you want to use a wetting agent that is going to do exactly that. It's not, it's not going to um, spread the droplets out on the leaf tissue. It's going to get the, uh, the, the, the droplets uh, through the, the turf canopy uh, and to the, to the soil. Um, where you, you do see wetting agents used uh, in um, ornamental horticulture, for instance. So they have um, pests um, that are on, on the, the plant itself, on the leaf tissue. So they will use uh, wetting agents. Uh, that will uh, make the, the, the water drop it spread over the, the leaf uh, and will spread over the actual um, pest itself because in, in that case you don't want a big water droplet that's just going to bounce uh, off the leaf you want you want that that spreading ability so yes you can use wetting agents but make sure they're compatible with nematodes that they've been tested and proven to be compatible with nematodes uh, and that they're the, the type of wetting agent that gets the the droplets down onto uh, you know the, the the base onto the surface of, of the root zone, uh, not spreading um, over the, the leaf tissue. Okay, and we've got another question: Do EPNs negatively impact earthworms, which are a problem for quite a lot of people? Um, or, as the name suggests, are EPNs restricted to insect larvae? Uh, yes, yeah, so they 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 haven't been uh, any. I'm not aware of them uh, actually controlling uh, earthworms, or, or if they do, it's certainly not to any great extent. Um, so I, I would say that they are safe for worms. As I say, it's, it's larvae uh, and juvenile larvae that they, that they um, are able to control. Um, and I say that it's juvenile larvae because if we take uh, Schaefer grubs, for instance, um, it's the first and second instar that they'll control. When a Schaefer grub gets to a third instar, it's better able to protect itself. So um, it doesn't release CO2 in one long stream, it will release it in bursts as it goes through the soil. Um, and also it will shut down its, its anus and it will shut, it will close its mouth. So it's restricting uh, the, the, the openings for nematodes to get into. Uh, and also they can actually um, clean themselves. They're, uh, you know, they're, 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 uh, they can wash off uh, nematodes on, on their surface when they, when they get to that, that latest, uh, more mature stage. So um, that's why, uh, most likely why they're, they're not um, having a, a great impact on worms is because it is um, newly hatched juvenile larvae and grubs that they're, they're, they're best able to control. Okay. And finally, will any new chemicals be available soon? Um, well, as you know, 
I work for Bayer. Bayer is a, a research and development company. Um, we are, uh, you know, we have a pipeline of development. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the control of, of turf pests uh, is important to us. So, you know, we, we are investigating it. But um, um, there is currently, or in the last couple of years, has been the, the um, uh, a competitor product called uh, a Celeprin uh, that's been available under uh, emergency use. Uh, whether or not that will be available under emergency use uh, anymore uh, or in the future remains to be seen. Um, but I think uh, other than that, uh, a, a new insecticide um, is a few years away and um, it's quite likely because of uh, the, the changes in the regulatory requirements um, you know, all these different studies that have to be conducted and proven um, for the efficacy. Uh, so we have to show the, 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 the minimum amount of active ingredient that achieves control and that kind of thing. So I think um, if a insecticide does become available um, in, the, in the future, it's probably not going to be as effective as, as the insecticides that we've had in the past, uh, ultimately. Okay, that's great. Um, I've got one final question, which is actually a question for me to answer. Will a video recording of this be made available soon? Yes, it will be in the members area um, within the next couple of hours, uh, barring no technical issues. So I'd like to say thank you, Colin. Um, that's been uh, very interesting, I'm sure, for all the, for all the listeners. Um, as you can see, we've got the CPD credit code there. So please do claim your credits for these webinars. Um, we would like to thank you for joining us and we hope that you'll join us again soon. Uh, for details of future Continue to Learn Extra webinars, please visit the What's On page of the Bigger website. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Many thanks. Thank you.